Chapter Three of The Hidden Places. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Hidden Places by Bertrand W. Sinclair. Chapter Three. About ten days later, Tommy Rutherford walked into Hollister's room at eight in the evening. He laid his cap and gloves on the bed, seated himself swung his feet to and fro for a second, and reached for one of Hollister's cigarettes. "'It's a hard world, old thing,' he complained. "'Here was I, all set for an enjoyable winter. Nice people in Vancouver, all sorts of fetching affairs on the tappy, and I'm to be demobilized myself next week. Chucked out into the blooming street with a gratuity and a couple of medals.' Damn the luck! He remained absorbed in his own reflections for a minute, blowing smoke rings with meticulous care. I wonder if a fellow could make it go in Mexico, he drawled. Hollister made no comment. Oh, well, hang it, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, he remarked with an abrupt change of tone. I'm going to a hop at the Granada presently. Banish dull care and all that, for the time being, anyway. His gaze came to an inquiring rest on Hollister. "'What's up, old thing?' he asked lightly. "'Why so mum?' "'Oh, nothing much,' Hollister answered. "'Bad thing to get in the dumps,' Rutherford observed sagely. You ought to keep a bottle of scotch handy for that. Drink myself into a state of mind where the world glitters and becomes joyful, huh? No, I don't fancy your prescription. I'd be more apt to run amuck. Oh, come now, Rutherford remonstrated. It isn't so bad as that. Cheer up, old man. Things might be worse, you know. Oh, hell! Hollister exploded. After which he relapsed into a sullen silence, to which Rutherford, frankly mystified and somewhat inclined to resent this self-contained mood, presently left him. Hollister was glad when the man went away. He had a feeling of relief when the door closed and retreating footsteps echoed down the hall. He had grasped at a renewal of Rutherford's acquaintance as a man drowning in a sea of loneliness would grasp at any friendly straw. And Rutherford, Hollister quickly realized, was the most fragile sort of straw. The man was a profound, non-thinking egotist, the adventurer pure and simple, whose mentality never rose above grossness of one sort and another, in spite of a certain outward polish. He could tolerate Hollister's mutilated countenance because he had grown accustomed to horrible sights, not because he had any particular sympathy for a crippled, mutilated man's misfortune, or any understanding of such a man's state of feeling. To Rutherford that was the fortune of war. So many were killed, so many crippled, so many disfigured. It was luck. He believed in his own luck. The evil that befell other men left him rather indifferent. That was all. When Hollister once grasped Rutherford's attitude, he almost hated the man. He sat now staring out the window. A storm had broken over Vancouver that day. Tonight it was still gathering force. The sky was a lowering, slate-colored mass of clouds, spitting squally bursts of rain that drove in wet lines against his window and made the street below a glistening area shot with tiny streams and shallow puddles that were splashed over the curb by rolling motor wheels. The wind droned its ancient melancholy chant among the telephone wires, shook with its unseen, powerful hands a row of bare maples across the way, rattled the windows in their frames. Now and then, in a momentary lull of the wind, a brief cessation of the city noises, Hollister could hear far off 
the beat of the gulf seas bursting on the beach at English Bay, snoring in the mouth of False Creek. A dreary, threatening night that fitted his mood. He sat pondering over the many-horned dilemma upon which he hung impaled. He had done all that a man could do. He had given the best that was in him, played the game faithfully, according to the rules and the net result had been for him the most complete disaster. So far as Myra went, he recognized that domestic tragedy as a natural consequence. He did not know, he was unable to say, if his wife had simply been a weak and shallow woman, left too long alone, thrown too largely on her own resources in an environment so strongly tinctured by the high-pitched and reckless spirit generated by the war. He had always known that his wife, women generally were the same, he supposed, was dominated by emotional urges rather than cold reason. But that had never struck him as of great significance. Women were like that. A peculiar obtuseness concealed from him, until now, that men also were much the same. He was himself. When his feelings and his reason came into conflict, it was touch and go which should triumph. The fact remained that for a long time the war had separated them as effectually as a divorce court. Hollister had always had a hazy impression that Myra was the sort of woman to whom love was necessary, but he had presumed that it was the love of a particular man, and that man himself. This, it seemed, was a mistake, and he had paid a penalty for making that mistake. So he accepted this phase of his unhappiness without too much rancor. Myra had played fair, he perceived. She had told him what to expect, and the accident of a misleading report had permitted her to follow her bent with a moral sanction. That she had bestowed herself and some forty thousand dollars of his money on another man was not the thing Hollister resented. He resented only the fact that her glow of love for him had not endured, that it had gone out like an untended fire but for some inscrutable reason that had happened. He had built a dream house of an unstable foundation. It had tumbled down. Very well. He accepted that. But he did not accept this unuttered social dictum that he should be kept at arm's length because he had suffered a ghastly disarrangement of his features while acting as a shield behind which the rest of society rested secure. No, he would never accept that as a natural fact. He could not. No one said that he was a terrible object which should remain in the background along with family skeletons and unmentionable diseases. He was like poverty and injustice, present but ignored. And this being shunned and avoided, as if he were something which should go about in furtive obscurity, was rapidly driving Hollister to a state approaching desperation. For he could not rid himself of the social impulse any more than a healthy man can rid himself of the necessity for food and drink at certain intervals. If Hollister had been so crushed in body and mind that his spirit was utterly quenched, if his vitality had been so drained that he could sit passive and let the world go by unheeded, then he would have been at peace. He had seen men like that, many of them, content to sit in the sun, to be fed and let alone. Their hearts were broken as well as their bodies. But except for the distortion of his face, he returned as he had gone away, a man in full possession of his faculties, his passions, his strength. He could not be passive either physically or mentally. His mind was too alert, his spirit too sensitive, his body too crammed with vitality to see life go swinging by and have no hand in its manifestations and adventures. 
Yet he was growing discouraged. People shunned him, shrank from contact. His scarred face seemed to dry up in others the fountain of friendly intercourse. If he were a leper or a man convicted of some hideous crime, his isolation could not be more complete. It was as if the sight of him affected men and women with a sense of something unnatural, monstrous. He sweated under this. But he was alive, and life was a reality to him, the will to live a dominant force. Unless he succumbed in a moment of madness, he knew that he would continue to struggle for life and happiness because that was instinctive, and fundamental instincts are stronger than logic, reason, circumstance. How he was going to make his life even tolerably worth living was a question that harassed him with disheartening insistence as he watched through his window the slanting lines of rain and listened to the mournful cadences of the wind. "'I must get to work at something,' he said to himself. If I sit still and think much more, he did not carry that last sentence to its logical conclusion. Deliberately, he strove to turn his thought out of the depressing channels in which it flowed and tried to picture what he should set about doing. Not office work. He could not hope for any inside position, such as his experience easily enabled him to fill. He knew timber the making and marketing of it, from top to bottom. But he could not see himself behind a desk, directing or selling. His face would frighten clients. He smiled, that rare grimace he permitted himself when alone. Very likely he would have to accept the commonest sort of labor, in a mill-yard, or on a booming ground among workers not too sensitive to a man's appearance. Staring through the streaming window, Hollister looked down on the traffic flow in the street, the hurrying figures that braved the storm in pursuit of pleasure or of necessity, and while that desperate loneliness gnawed at him, he felt once more a sense of utter defeat, of hopeless isolation. And for the first time he wished to hide, to get away out of sight and hearing of men. It was a fugitive impulse, but it set his mind harking back to the summer he had spent holidaying along the British Columbia coast long ago. The tall office buildings, with yellow window squares dotting the black walls, became the sun-bathed hills looking loftily down on rivers and bays and inlets that he knew. The wet floor of the street itself became a rippled arm of the sea, stretching far and silent between wooded slopes where deer and bear and all the furtive wild things of the forest went their accustomed way. Hollister had wandered alone in those hushed places, sleeping with his face to the stars, and he had not been lonely. He wondered if he could do that again. He sat nursing those visions, his imagination pleasantly quickened by them, as a man sometimes finds ease from care in dreaming of old days that were full of gladness. He was still deep in the past when he went to bed, and when he arose in the morning, the far places of the B.C. coast beckoned with a more imperious gesture as if in those solitudes lay a sure refuge for such as he. And why not, he asked himself. Here in this pushing seaport town, among the hundred and fifty thousand souls eagerly intent upon their business of gaining a livelihood, of making money, there was not one who cared whether he came or went, whether he was glad or sad, whether he had a song on his lips or the blackest gloom in his heart. He had done his bit as a man should. In the doing, he had been broken in a cruel variety of ways. The war machine had chewed him up and spat him out on the scrap heap. None of these hale, 
unmanned citizens, cared to be annoyed by the sight of him, of what had happened to him. And he could not much longer endure this unapproachableness, this palpable shrinking. He could not much longer bear to be in the midst of light and laughter, of friendly talk and smiling faces, and be utterly shut off from any part in it all. He was in as evil case as a man chained to a rock and dying of thirst, while a clear, cold stream flowed at his feet. Whether he walked the streets or sat brooding in his room, he could not escape the embittered consciousness that, all about him, there was a great plenty of kindly fellowship which he craved, and which he could not share, because war had stamped its iron heel upon his face. Yes, the more he thought about it, the more he craved the refuge of silence and solitude. If he could not escape from himself, at least he could withdraw from this feast at which he was a death's head. And so he began to cast about him for a place to go, for an objective, for something that should save him from being purely aimless. In the end it came into his mind that he might go back and look over this timber in the valley of the Toba River, this last vestige of his fortune which remained to him by pure chance. He had bought it as an investment for surplus funds. He had never even seen it. He would have smiled, if his face had been capable of smiling, at the irony of his owning ten million feet of Douglas fir and red cedar, material to build a thousand cottages, he who no longer owned a roof to shelter his head, whose cash resources were only a few hundred dollars. Whether Lewis sold the timber or not, he would go and see it. For a few weeks he would be alone in the woods, where men would not eye him askance nor dainty, fresh-faced women shrink from him as they passed. End of chapter 3 Recording by Roger Moline